YouTube feminist Anita Sarkeesian, a.k.a. Feminist Frequency, has released the second video in her much-publicized series, Tropes vs. Women in Video Games. The reaction to her latest video is impossible to accurately quantify because she has once again disabled comments, ratings, and even statistics. For someone whose slogan is Conversations with Pop Culture, Anita seems remarkably uninterested in discussion. Her video is entitled Damsel in Distress, Part 2, and the problems with it are both immense and abundant. It's actually difficult to confine my refutation to a single video. I feel that I could write a small book in response to Anita, but I will resist that urge for the sake of my audience, because I know that they're not ready for me to unload yet another one of my rambling forays into the printed word at them. So it should be noted, seriously, get out those notebooks, it should be noted that this video does not cover every criticism that I have of Anita's most recent video. It only addresses what I've come to call the big ones. And when I say the big ones, I'm not referring to a buxom pair of breasts. I wish I was, but I'm not. First, let's talk about the damsel in distress trope and why it's so prevalent. According to Anita, the trope exists as a sort of patriarchal, cultural reinforcement broadcasting a misogynistic message to our entire culture that men are strong and capable, whereas women are weak and in need of rescuing. Anita is apparently very convinced that this analysis is correct, but I'm not. Joseph Campbell was a mythologist and an expert in comparative mythology. He was the first person to document an interesting phenomenon called the monomyth, perhaps more commonly known as the hero's journey. Campbell noticed that hero myths from every culture follow a similar narrative structure. I'm about to grossly oversimplify Campbell's work here, but the monomyth structure reduced to its simplest form is this. The hero is living his normal existence, whatever that may be, when all of a the sudden there is a call to adventure. Something happens to disrupt his everyday life and he's whisked off on a journey, often reluctantly. He then faces a plethora of challenges and obstacles before achieving his goal and returning from his adventure with something of value to give the world that he left. Hero stories still conform to this formula. Think Star Wars. Think The Matrix. Many video games also conform to this basic formula. Let's look at Mario, for instance. Pretty much every Mario game, aside from the sport and party games, involves Mario leading his everyday normal life when all of a sudden, the princess is abducted. This is his call to adventure. This is where you, the gamer, take over and guide Mario through a series of trials and obstacles until he rescues the princess and she's so grateful that... Well, it never exactly says that she puts out, but I think we all know that she does. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Mario and Bowser worked this whole deal out in advance, now that I really think about it. Now let's talk about the call to action. That's the part of the monomyth we need to focus on to understand the damsel in distress trope. Think about your own life and what it would take to compel you to go on a dangerous quest. Maybe you do it because your current life dissatisfies you and you long for something new and exciting. Maybe you do it because the world was in danger or to seek revenge or power or to save someone that you love. For most people, that's their spouse or partner and their kids. And of all the reasons that a character might embark on a quest, saving or avenging a loved one is probably the easiest to convey quickly. I think that is the reason for the damsel in distress trope. I don't think it's designed to denigrate women. I think it's just an easy plot device. So if that's the case, why is it almost always the male characters saving the female ones? Because most games, particularly action games, have male protagonists. And why are most gaming protagonists male? Because males are the primary players of the sorts of action games where these plot devices are used. Most game developers are also male. Taking all that into account, it's no wonder that a male perspective is so prevalent in these games. 
Is the simple act of telling a story with a male protagonist now sexist in the eyes of feminists like Anita Sarkeesian? I would say that the damsel in distress trope shows how much men love the women in their lives and will go through tremendous adversity for them. I'd say the prevalence of this trope and really, I prefer the term plot device to trope in this instance. I'd say the prevalence of this plot device actually says something good about men and male values. The main case that Anita makes for why the damsel in distress plot device is problematic is that the stories built around it cannot be removed from the larger cultural context. Games don't exist in a vacuum and therefore can't be divorced from the larger cultural context of the real world. Which is odd, since she has no problem removing scenes from these games from their proper narrative context. Of course, if you look at any of these games in isolation, you'll be able to find incidental narrative circumstances that can be used to explain away the inclusion of violence against women as a plot device. But just because a particular event might make sense within the internal logic of a fictional narrative, that doesn't in and of itself justify its use. So is context a good thing or a bad thing, Anita? You can't have your cake and eat it too. These games, according to her, disempower women by showing them to be nothing more than victims. Anita Sarkeesian says that this is particularly offensive given how often women are victimized in real life. It's especially troubling in light of the serious real-life epidemic of violence against women facing the female population on this planet. Every nine seconds, a woman is assaulted or beaten in the United States. And on average, more than three women are murdered by their boyfriends, husbands, or ex-partners every single day. So, wait. Anita objects to video games showing women as victims, but then goes out of her way to convince you that, yes, women are victims. I think the real problem here is that Anita is reversing the cause and the effect. She thinks that things like video games displaying women as victims is feeding into the mass victimization of women in real life. It seems far more plausible to me that the opposite is true. That the amount of female victims in real life probably fuels the prevalence of female victims in art and entertainment. Because let's face it. Women are more likely to be victimized, and probably they always will be. Popular culture, including video games, probably doesn't play a significant role in this. It's much more likely that women are victimized because they are physically weaker than men. If women were physically stronger, I have little doubt that men would be disproportionately victimized. Bad people will always pick on those weaker than they are, regardless of sex. Let's get to the nitty gritty on this disempowerment issue. Here's a question. If the protagonist to a game was gay, and he was on a mission to rescue his boyfriend or his husband, would that disempower men? If a female character must rescue a male character, does that disempower men? If the protagonist of a story is black and the person he or she is rescuing is white, does that disempower white people? If the answer is no to all of these questions, and I think that it is, then how can Anita say that a man rescuing a woman disempowers women? There's no consistency. But of course, the feminist response to that is that men are the oppressors, and therefore anything that men do that can be construed as sexism will be construed as sexism, no matter how much of a stretch it is. We're not allowed to show female disempowerment in games, according to Anita, but let's face it, female disempowerment is a fact of life. If a six-foot-tall man wants to rape a five-foot-tall woman, he's probably not going to encounter much difficulty. The woman is a victim, and a disempowered one at that. Are we to say that this very real-life circumstance of female victimization and disempowerment cannot be portrayed in art or entertainment? I could perhaps understand that attitude if the games Anita was attacking were advocating such a thing, but these acts are almost universally committed by the bad guys, who the hero must then defeat. Anita Sarkeesian is not trying to right a social injustice here. She's not trying to address a concrete problem that can be definitively solved. She's trying to say that one way of perceiving things, her way, is right. And another way of perceiving things, that is, the attitudes of gamer culture, are wrong. And if she's going to make such a case, I expect strong evidence, not just strong rhetoric. 
So to recap, the damsel in distress trope is used because it's a convenient plot device, not to send the message that women are weak. It's usually a damsel that's in distress because it's usually a man holding the game controller. And the fact that women are victimized in real life is exactly why it would be unconscionable to specifically avoid showing female victimization in video games. So in closing, I think that Anita Sarkeesian needs to pull her head out of her vagina monologues for a moment and recognize her own victim status, because she is a victim of confirmation bias. She looks for sexism and misogyny everywhere, and surprise, 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 she finds it everywhere.